Welcome, everybody, to Jive Talk. Sorry for the delay today. We had a few technical difficulties, but we're now getting started. I first discovered the historian and author, Dr. Raoul McLaughlin, when I was researching the Silk Road in antiquity and the connections between ancient Rome and China. And I was led down an intriguing rabbit hole learning about the Roman economy and its connection to the Near East and the Far East, both India and China. His PhD from Lagan College in Belfast is in Roman economy and trade beyond imperial frontiers. And he previously studied for an undergraduate degree in archaeology at Queen's, Queen's University in Belfast, and then an MA in the economy of the Roman Empire. He also has three published books, Rome and the Distant East, the Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, and the Roman Empire and the Silk Roots, and a forthcoming book entitled The Roman Empire and the Oasis Kingdoms. He is a founder member of the Classical Association in Northern Ireland, a council member of the Classical Association of Ireland, and associate editor of the academic journal Classics Ireland. So without further ado, um, welcome Dr. McLaughlin, happy to have you here. Sorry, I, I just had, had you muted there, sorry. Welcome sorry. again. Thank you, thank you. On my fault for muting you. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for taking time out uh, on a Saturday to, to speak to us. And uh, I know it's a, a bit of a pain with all the technical stuff, but uh, it's good to have you here. Thank you. So I'd like to know what first sparked your interest in the subject of the Roman economy and its links with the East? I suppose, uh, well, I have, a, I have a background in archaeology. Um, archaeology is, well, difficult to ignore if you're in Ireland. There's, there's so many um, ancient sites and there's this continual presence around you. So, so I, I went to Queen's University Archaeology and then I took uh, three and did a, a joint honours in, in those subjects. Um, but I was... I became fascinated with the the ancient texts and how they could be used to explain the artifacts and the um, these ancient ceremonial sites and, and fortifications and uh, outposts. And um, in my master's year, we uh, masters in ancient history at Queens was very concerned with um, broadening the subject and looking at numismatics and um, the sort of the underlying processes that were structuring the, the Roman world and Roman society. And I think a lot of historians, they they find the economy, they, they find the ancient economy, their subject sort of leads it, leads leads them into it. Um, they, they need to explain these uh, processes and, and developments. And um, the case with the economics is that uh, ancient, artifacts are discovered and they need to be explained and what i've always found curious is these these artifacts that sort of can be explained or are sort of oddities in in, in the their, the locations and um, from an archaeological background it always seems strange that a lot of the writing on the classical world is, is confined to the mediterranean there's the alexander the great who takes that great sort of detour into the east uh but Beyond that, it can be very confined, and certainly from the perspective of an Irish archaeologist, I, I was always thinking of um, the world outside the empire um, and how it might relate to uh, the the core territories, the, the center of the study. Yeah, I, I think I'm guilty as one of those many historians who don't really have a thorough understanding of economics and probably neglect the subject a lot more than they should. Um, do you think uh, it's important for, I mean, or obviously you do, but why do you think understanding ancient economics is important for, for understanding the ancient Rome or studying history in general? To explain the, the, the processes really, I mean, you're, you're aware of the, the new breakthroughs, breakthroughs in genetic research and um, it's a, uh, it's almost uh, an economic problem uh, to explain how people moved and um, what kind of factors were 
uh, opposing them or, or, or encouraging them. Uh, it's it's an unknown that's that's hard for historians and archaeologists to explain. And it's uh, economics is a great way to contextualize evidence um, to try to understand the 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 limitations. Um, you'll find a lot of historians dismiss uh, figures in the ancient texts, but often the the best way to to test information is to uh, look at the evidence or look at the parameters or uh, try to fit um, evidence within within models uh, to try to determine what 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 is feasible, what isn't feasible. Um, but but it's, I'm sorry that that sounds quite vague, but if you've seen my work, it's, I try to, well, um, avalanche evidence into arguments and, and really try to structure things in that way. Yeah, I've seen quite a lot of your videos and I, I recognize that um, the actual debate about the veracity of the evidence or the or concerning the Roman economy is the subject of a very fierce debate which you uh, contrib are you contributing to now and uh, that I guess do you think that that uh, this debate is starting to change the, the you know direction a bit that's a uh, a difficult question uh, academia is is very slow um, you'll find that they're responding to issues that were occurring three, maybe four years ago. Um, and it's a, a slow process to make any changes. And I think it's because the institutions often train and promote people to think a certain way. Um, you're following a, 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 I guess, a master, um, somebody who is providing encouragement and funding and, and connections. And therefore, if you want to, if you want to say something that's truly new, um, either you need uh, a breakthrough of evidence or um, you can find yourself, uh, I guess, on the outside. Um, if your ideas don't match what um, the, the orthodoxy suggests. Mm. I, th I think there's a kind of like um, a Buddha against a Brahmin with a Brahmin or something on that level would be um, facing rather uh, difficult obstacles to try and get new ideas uh, across. But uh, I, I know in one of your videos, you were very interesting. You talked uh, about the influence of Moses Finley, who himself was influenced by the Frankfurt School and his uh, Moses Finley's had a big uh, influence on the debate that I, we we're talking about in Roman economics. Uh, but in the video, you quite you, you offer some criticism of it, and uh, you seem to indicate. I've got the impression from the video that this um, the Finley's perspective is sort of gradually being considered outdated, or at least people are more willing to accept an opposing view. Yes. Uh, there's a tendency for even criticism or opposition of those ideas to be framed work with, within uh, Finley's thinking. Um, I, I think it's the, the form that, that, that education takes in the universities that you, you learn, you, you follow these sort of masters, these um, often ideologues. Um, uh, people who have set ideas about um, how the world operated based on sociology or, or other uh, concepts. And it's, uh, you have to assess their ideas, repeat their ideas, consider their ideas, match the evidence to their ideas. And often a lot of scholars don't develop beyond that. They, they're still conceptualizing the information within those systems. Um, and a lot of um, work on the ancient economy reads like a, <clears throat> a, a review, almost like a reviewing a film or, or a book, but it's previous ideas and how they might be adjusted. And it's like a, an incremental 
a, a crawl forward um, each new work, um, mm -hmm. going through the old arguments and then trying to adjust things or move things a little further. And I mean, in my own work, I, I could have, I could have critiqued their theories and offered uh, reviews of their work, but I thought I would just present my own work in in uh, the Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean and the Roman Empire and the Silk Roads, and try to construct um, my own vision of how well evidence based model, I should say. Uh, there's a tendency to call these these models of the Roman economy visions and um, imaginative schemes and uh, other such uh, terminology that uh, I, I wanted to place it back on um, back on the evidence, back on the sources and the the archaeological material. And I think with economics, there is there's something you you can't quite refute. I mean, I, I could talk about the influence of religions and um, but when you put it on this perspective of money and, and finances and, and what it can create and enable, then it's uh, difficult for somebody to entirely refute your work. Um, and hopefully, uh, I was hoping that uh, with the publication of my work in a, in a with a popular publisher who who could um, promote and disseminate the the information that that people would start to pick up and uh, pick up these themes and engage with them and, and question them and, and compare them. I mean, uh, when I was writing about um, Red Sea coral and, and how it was used and um, the belief systems that of, of India and, and how. It, Coral was considered and its mythological origins um, that people. Could you tell us a bit about that? Because I don't know anything. So I presume it's some kind of jewelry used as a jewelry. Yes, it's um, listed as one of the the treasures of the um, the the Indian courts and the uh, it's Mediterranean red coral. If you read Pliny the Elder, you you find out how it was. Um, the Romans used to sink these sort of iron nets into the water around Sicily and the coral would become encrusted and grow around it. And unlike other corals, uh, when they, they dragged these things ashore and dried them out, it, it became this beautiful porcelain-like uh, material that the Romans then polished and crafted into ornaments. And Pliny tells us about how the, the Celts, um, you know, a lot of Celtic weaponry and um, mm -hmm. it has the, the red enamel, um, uh, the uh, listener Kroger, the, the ones from Northern Ireland. Well, uh, if you look up images of that, you'll, you'll... so the, the Pliny tells us how the Celts used to ornament their their shields with uh, the red coral, but in his own time, it was barely seen in um, Italy or uh, Gaul, and the the reason was that this material was being um, exported um, in, in large amounts from the Roman Empire. Uh, Roman traders in Egypt were loading it aboard ships and taking it to India. And we have find Indian texts as well that um, mention the sort of mythological origins of the, the, uh, the red coral from uh, the uh, treatise on Sanskrit mentions that the it is from the island of the Avanas, and the, the Romans appear in um, Indian sources as these Yavanas, these Ionian Greeks. Uh, and there is a sort of merging of identities that occurs in this period between the Romans and the Greeks, and the Indians uh, sort of recognize this. Um, but there's also um, foundation myths about how the, um, well, the Romans have their own foundation myths about how coral was created from the I think it's uh, Perseus and the, the Medu head of the Medusa. It drops these um, droplets of blood fall into the the uh, the Mediterranean and are and there's uh, some of the Hindu texts also have these uh, mythological stories about how coral was created and formed and um, it's 
has supernatural effects as well as being a um but that's sorry that's just one very small aspect of uh the eastern trade um, for for those know. like who, who who aren't really familiar at all with the interdependence of the indian and the roman economies what is could you give like a quick just i mean i you can i know you've got proper thorough descriptions and in, in analyses in your channel but just for those in the audience who would like to know a bit more about it could you just explain a bit about what it looked like sort of what which 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 side of that trade route was getting the better deals and and wh what kind of profits were being made well um <clears throat> our sources we have the uh Periplus of the erythraean sea which is written by a, an alexandrian greek and he wrote an account around about AD 50 of Roman voyages. Um, they sailed from ports in the, the Red Sea, Berenike and Myos Hormos, uh, sailed down through the, the Red Sea Gulf, and then they uh, launched into the ocean and uh, sailed directly across to the Tamil lands or it sailed to Northern India. So he gives a full account of these trade routes and trade runs and the, the commodities on offer and who was in power, politics of the area, the threat of pirates, the marine hazards, the um, risks of storms, or um, even the Romans were crossing through territories affected by war. But we also have uh, Pliny, and, and Pliny provides us with information on the, 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 the expense of the, the, the exports. Uh, he gives us these figures and they're variously interpreted and they're sometimes to, uh, probably they represent bullion exports and the Romans are concerned because obviously they're, they're losing money um, and there's a Roman Roman ideology they, they sort of see their state or they think that their state should function as uh, a a well-managed estate, like a, um, the sort of rustic idea of the farmer um, managing. Um, sorry, this is quite getting quite rambling, but anyway, he, he disapproved of the the, the export of uh, precious metal, and this was enriching um, Indian uh, Indian kingdoms. Uh, but is that not a, a sound economic model that if you he should have been concerned, perhaps, of the of the export of too much of the precious metal, if it, unless it was being replaced by some uh, an equally valuable commodity. Or, or am I missing something? No, it is a concern um, because, in return, they're receiving pepper, and silk, and, and pearls, and uh, cotton fabrics, and uh, these are sustainable items. Um, I mean, it may not be a a directly mo modern concern, but they were aware they were losing money and they were aware that uh, these were going towards luxuries, uh, non-essentials. I mean, the Romans didn't have to dress in silks or um, consume spices with their, their meals or um, probably incense is a, is, a, is a separate issue because the Romans were also receiving incense from um, the Yemen and Defor and uh, sort of uh, Southern Arabia, the, the Roman ships that sailed to India would call at the, the trade stations in um, Adalis. And um, the, these were uh, small um, Arabian kingdoms that uh, they've also probably made a lot of money from uh, producing and making these uh, incense available to the Roman traders who visited their, their territories. Uh, we get an idea of the scale of the trade from Strabo, the, the geographer writing around the time of the, the, the first emperor, Augustus. And um, I mean, these are people who are well informed and they're, they're close to Roman government. Uh, Pliny's an advisor to the emperor uh, Vespasian. Um, he's in his sort of, uh, I suppose, a, a consul, a consul of uh, advisors who would meet and discuss matters with the, the emperor. Um, 
and Strabo is uh, close to the governor of uh, Egypt when he, uh, Roman governor of Egypt, when he makes this statement about the number of ships. And these would have been substantial vessels. I mean, uh, 300 tons. Um, there are remains of the parts of hulls found in um, Berenike, uh, a Stephen, Professor Stephen Seibotham. Um, I think he's got a YouTube lecture um, on this subject, but he's been excavating the port um, and on to, um, uncovering remains of uh, jetties and piers and uh, warehouses and loading facilities, uh, uh, construction sites, um, places where they would have uh, put the lead sheathing on these vessels, uh, workshops and uh, there's also some shipwrecks in the Red Sea. But the, the thing is, by putting, by putting these figures in context, um, you can start to think about uh, Roman policy, why things are occurring. I mean, you, you, books will often mention the, the Farrison Islands, which are, uh, well, they're about 600 miles from the the Roman Egyptian frontiers at the, the entrance to the Red Sea almost. And the Romans established an outpost, a, a base there. Um, and once you realize the sort of, um, uh, the money that has been transferred out of the empire and the, the, the scale of the flow of commodities returning. Um, and we have things like the Muserus Papyrus, which outlines the, the, the value of a cargo. Um, so all of this can be reconstructed and we also have statements about um, the revenues of the provinces, and they fit quite neatly together into, um, well, uh, my model of the Roman economy, which would suggest that uh, probably about a third of the, the imperial revenues came from uh, taxing this, this flow of commerce between uh, India and the Roman Empire. Uh, Fair, I mean, that's quite a lot, yeah. Yes. I know some of your some some of the uh, opposing theories would they would they cast doubt on the the, the validity of these figures, um, and I guess you find that frustrating. Yes, um, I, I think the, the the best way to oppose that is just to. Uh, reveal all the evidence, um, to collect all the evidence for um, the Romans' use of pepper, um, and then broadcast it, uh, make it available to people, like, let them make up their own minds um, about the scale of the, the commerce and its significance. Um, mm. there, there's so many. Uh, virtually everything you read about the Augustan era, uh, the, the poetry, the um, the historical sources themselves. You, you keep finding references to um, incense and spices and cottons and silks and pearls and gemstones. Um, there's so many anecdotes and this can all be reconstructed into a, um, a sort of model of consumerism. And in my next book, I talk about uh, the Rome, in Rome itself and the um, how how that retail was conducted the the arcade where they they sold pearls the the trips that uh um Ovid and, and marshall describe about um seeing in indian commodities in the i don't want to call them high streets but in the these porticos where where people used to sell their wares and um you have that is it juvenile um yes uh in Indian fortune tellers used to be um, in the center of Rome and would, would, would sell their, um, their uh, um, I don't want to say advice, but uh, an interpretation of the future uh, to Roman women, wealthy Roman women, yes. So the prognosticators for the, for the wealthy. Um, yes, yes. Oh, that's really interesting. And did you? So this book is your Oasis Kingdoms one, yes? That you're talking about? Yes, yes. And that, but that the title refers, I presume, to something for, up in the in the what is it in the 
Takla Makan or in, in Saudi Arabia? Um, it was a, it, it continues from the, uh, well, the, the Roman Empire and the Silk Roots was becoming a, a, an absolute monster of a book. Uh, and I was also starting to consider uh, the step, um, the, the movement of goods and peoples across the, the Caspian and the Black Sea and the significance of the, the Crimea as a, an area that produces grain and facilitates um, commerce and the, the movement of commodities between uh, the steppe and the, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, Oasis Kingdoms is, it's Palmyra. Uh, I have three chapters in the book about Palmyra. Um, and also uh, these Babylonia and Antioch and uh, the string of a string of cities through Iran and but especially the the Tarim Basin and these uh, Kashgar and um, places that would become Samarkand and um, the Chinese efforts to control the um, Tarim Oasis states and the, there's some great Chinese material on uh, population figures and the movement of commodities and this is something attested in the, the Roman sources that as Pericles of the Erythraean Sea says that there's a, a, a transit of silk through this region and it ends up in um, what is the Kushan Empire. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's um, Afghanistan and, and uh, Begram and um, the, the Indus kingdoms eventually. Uh, so these were... Um, states that were, I don't want to say comparable to the Roman Empire, but they were large and sophisticated uh, and, and wealthy. Um, we have uh, books on Indian statescraft that, that explain the um, how commerce and trade would have operated through these kingdoms. Uh, and they're, they're, they're very sophisticated. Um, a lot of advice, a lot of practical advice about taxing and controlling commodities. And, uh, mm. There's a, such a wealth of uh, evidence, it's um, al almost difficult to discuss and a lot of avenues of different um, uh, trade and investigation. Yeah, so much to talk about. I, I guess there's a lot of perhaps similarities in way between the way that Iranic speaking people sort of got a uh, hold of that got a, played a massive a pivotal role in the the trade between China and Rome just as there a similar kind of thing happening from what I understand uh, on the sea routes going from India to the, to Europe uh, around Arabia and uh, I understand there'd be some is it right to say that, that there was some tax havens popping up in ancient times where traders would just try to avoid the heavy taxes that they would receive in, in Rome or in India for, for, for trading there by just stopping off at these obscure places uh, on, on the way. Yes, um, um, the Arathustra, it's, uh, it suggests that about Romans, sorry, that foreign imports into Indian kingdoms should be taxed one-fifth, um, non-essentials. And the Roman Empire conducts a, a one-quarter rate tax called the Tatarche on all imports coming in through the uh, Roman Egypt. Uh, so there's sophistication, sophisticated systems in place to, sorry, <coughs> to place ships, place place goods under 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 bonds, and to have them transported. Uh, <coughs> in the Roman case, across the Eastern Desert and then to Coptos, the, the Nile River port, and then sent downstream to Alexandria, where the goods are uh, either taxed a quarter rate or the, the merchants surrender a quarter rate of the, um, the, the, the quarter percent of the cargo to imperial authorities that can be sold there or um, transferred to the, the capital in Rome, where there's these great warehouses um, in the center of the city can accommodate all these incoming goods. Um, but 
One way, and, and this occurs in the Ptolemaic period, uh, I should explain what happens is um, in the very late second century BC, an Indian merchant craft uh, sails around Arabia and uh, gets uh, becalmed in, in the Red Sea. And it's picked up by a Ptolemaic uh, patrol ship. And there's a, a single survivor who's taken to the Ptolemaic court in, in Alexandria. And he explains where he's come from. And uh, the, the Ptolemaic king then dispatches a sort of a, an exploratory mission um, to find the route, to, to discover the route between Egypt and India, which before this period hasn't been known. Um, but after that development, um, they meet in the middle um, more than anything else. Uh, so at Socotra Island, or um, that's off the, the coast of uh, East Africa, uh, the Horn of Africa, or in Aden, um, which is one of the, the Arabian, it's described as a city, but it's a, a port, um, an important harbor um, on the southwest coast of uh, of Arabia. Um, and one of the advantages of meeting in these sort of intermediate places is that you, you don't have to pay the, uh, the full tax. You're not interfered with by the Roman state or by the Indian kingdoms. Uh, the Indian kingdoms, uh, there's advice to their, uh, in the ancient texts that merchants from the homeland are, are Merchants from within the kingdom are not to be taxed as much as uh, foreign merchants. And one of the incentives that gives is for wealth and profits and to encourage your, your, your own merchants to, um, to prosper. Um, so this seems quite logical. Yes. Not, so, not, so, not such a common logic these days, but yeah. I, but we do have that same sort of behavior of tax avoiding global merchants and things like that. But uh, some things, nothing new under the sun, I suppose. But um, I, um, I also wanted to know a bit from your study of the economic relationships between these, you know, distant peoples. Did you think there's much? Uh, do you know much about how what kind of cultural relations went along with it, or how were Romans, for example, and their produce re regarded by people in India and China? Right. Um we're sort of limited by the surviving sources. Uh, well, there's no archaeological evidence of uh, Indian peoples in the, the, the Red Sea ports. There's the potsherds and uh, ordinary cooking utensils. Uh, and it's in Tamil Brahmi script. Uh, so we know the Tamils were in uh, reaching Roman Egypt. And the Diodorus uh, Chrysostom mentions the appearance of Indians in the, the Greek theaters. Um, sometimes they may be viewed amongst you. Um, so there is a, they are entering the Roman Empire and the Romans are reaching India in probably very large numbers. Uh, if you think that Strabo's figure of uh, 120 ships. And then you think that uh, a crew might have about uh, 50 people. And Pliny the Elder says that there's, there's cohorts of archers on board. You have is um, large numbers of Roman subjects reaching India and probably residing in India for s four months of the year because their, their arrival is uh, conditional on the monsoon. And the, the return monsoon doesn't start blowing until um, November, December. Um, some of the Romans in the, the Tamil area, they will uh, remain there just to have the, the, the pepper harvest arrive and, um, well, dry to a sufficient condition that it can be taken on board ship. Um, so one of the consequences of this is, well, if half, say half the Roman ships sailed to uh, Tamil, India, and uh, the Periplus suggests that a lot of ships would have, those ones sailing to the, the Indus kingdoms, 
would then have proceeded down the coast and um, uh, sort of um, collected together, rendezvoused at uh, a site um, just south of uh, Mozarest and El Sinda, which were the, the two main ports in the Tamil kingdoms. So that would be the, the Pandian kingdom on the very southern tip of India. Um, so what we find in the Tamil literature is references to the arrival of uh, Tamil literature is, is it's heroic literature. It's about sort of heroes and um, epic epic adventures. And but the poetry preserves references to Yavana ships, these, these Roman vessels arriving. Um, it's there's descriptions of uh, wine. Um, obviously, Mediterranean wine was taken on these 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 voyages and exchanged with the Tamil kings. Uh, there's references to Roman gold coins, which are uh, referred to as uh, like nape of the neck, because obviously the emperor is sort of a, a beheaded emblem. Um, <laughs> these 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 coins. Um, there's also references to what appears to be uh, Roman Roman mercenaries, perhaps. Uh, Yavana guards, Yavana guards in Madurai, which is the uh, the Pandian, uh, one of the Tamil capitals. So uh, the Tamil kings uh, are employing Roman mercenaries. Uh, yes, perhaps that would, that would be the, um, the the logical explanation that uh, they're described in. I think one of his battle tents as well that uh, the hero has to approach, um, or he has to enter the city um, past these. Um, stern-faced, um, strong-figured guards. Um, and they're, they're described in uh, strange clothing, which is fastened with a belt, um, a bag-like clothing, uh, which is maybe a reference to uh, tunics. Or, But this is believable when you, you think that, um, well, Pliny is saying that there, these ships are sailing with units of um, archers on board to Sort of combat pirates. I mean, uh, three thousand miles and a, a journey that would have taken about maybe seventy days to accomplish. Uh, one of the, the explanations for the Roman base in the Pharisees, these small group of islands um, near the entrance to the Red Sea, is that the Romans finally decide to take a, an interest in protecting ships that are sailing. Um, out of the Red Sea and, and this great distance from the empire, uh, and there's a the, the there's a Roman a late Roman map called the uh, Pyrtinga table, and it depicts uh, uh, an Augustan temple in, in southern India. Uh, I mean, the Indian the there are well, they're sometimes called Greek farces. They're um, plays and uh, novels and uh, they will describe adventures to India from the Roman perspective. Uh, you have this sort of uh, correlation of um, the Roman perspective of the Indians, the Indian perspective of the Romans. And um, further up the coast, um, sort of um, west coast of India, the Sarhavana kingdom, um, Nasik and, and Junar and there's these monastic sites where uh, inscriptions appear, which uh, were paid for by uh, what are called Yavana. They, they, they might be Roman subjects, descendants of Roman subjects. They might be some kind of remnant of the, the, the Indo-Greeks. Um, there, there is a, a, a lot of material. Um, we sort of lose sight of the the Romans in uh, northwest India. Um, mm. They're they're harder to to pick out of the uh, sort of cultural mix, and that, that might be because um, because of the Indians. yes, yeah. uh, we may be maybe easier for um, people in that region to uh, to well. Um, there are references to Indian slaves in the, the Roman Empire, and they sort of speak a curious form of Greek. So these might be... Uh... Yeah, I recall there was some kind of 
uh, some some interpretation, I think, by a uh, I can't remember if it was a Greek or an Indian thinking that Her Heracles met was was from Hare Krishna, or some you know misunderstanding, but uh, from the coins or something, um, but uh, which had Heracles written on it. But uh, yeah, it's very that was in northern India where there was this big cultural fusion of um, Greek and Bactrian and uh, Indian and whatnot. So I can imagine a Roman would get sort of lost in that confusing cultural melting pot um, quite easily. On on that subject, I, I also wanted to ask about what what I've been interested in recently in regards to Rome is the um, the genetic evidence has come out and two different papers um, have uh, I wanted to bring up that ha which might, I'd like to take hear your take on. One was um, titled "Ancient Rome: A Genetic Crossroads of Europe and the Mediterranean," and that showed that the Roman Republic and Imperial Rome were genetically distinct because the latter had seen an influx of Near Eastern and North African DNA, and then another paper published earlier this year was titled A Genetic History of the Near East from an ADNA time core sampling eight points in the past 4,000 years. And that showed that there was a genetic shift in ancient Lebanon during the early Roman period, uh, which was caused by an influx of DNA from South Asia, which they associated with uh, modern British Indian, modern British people of Indian descent and Sri Lankan descent and modern Pakistanis and modern Indians and Sri Lankan Tamils. They used a lot of uh, people of Indian descent and Sri Lankan descent from Britain because that's where they could get their samples. But um, based on your knowledge of the ancient Roman economy, could you explain w what you think is happening with these changes? Why, why Imperial Rome was becoming a bit more Near Eastern and, and why uh, Roman Lebanon was becoming more Indian. All right. Um, I mean, it, it's been acknowledged for a long time uh, that there's a, a cultural shift in, in the Roman Empire in the late Republic. Um, if you read um, Scholard uh, from the Gracchi to Nero, um, Ballston, um, Romans and Aliens. Uh, these these were books published about forty years ago, but it, it's known that Rome becomes very culturally Greek. Uh, there's that famous quote from Horace that um, Rome conquers Greece, but Greece overcomes its savage conqueror and mm -hmm. this is very evident in the the sources if you if you read if you read plutarch um life of tiberius gracchus um about two or three pages into the the text it, it explains what's happening in in roman italy and in the second century bc there's a, an influx of captured peoples, uh, prisoners of war, slaves, because of the Roman conquests, and they displace the, um, the, the indigenous rustic um, Latins, the, the, the Italian people in the countryside who then find that, um, well, a lot of them turn up in Rome itself as uh, uh, the story is that uh, uh, Tiberius Gracchus, when he's either heading to the, um, the these wars in uh, Spain, uh, Numantia, that he sees that the countryside has been worked by uh, gangs of slaves, and that there's an appeal um, to the, the politicians in Rome to do something about this. Uh, it, it's to do with the rich being able to employ gangs of slaves to work the land and then buy up more land and um, ordinary sort of farmer householders aren't able to compete with this um, and just become dispossessed and moved off the land. Uh, so there seems to be an influx of Italians into and Romans into the city itself. Um, there's probably an influx of 
peoples from North Africa to do with Rome's war against Carthage, um, an influx of slaves from uh, the Greek territories that are being conquered. Um, and these people, they, they can acquire citizenship uh, relatively easily by being um, they're enfranch enfranchised, they're, they're uh, a slave when he's made free, um, becomes a citizen. So very rapidly, uh, foreign peoples can be, they can become Roman citizens and adopt Roman mannerisms. Uh, they'll probably have some of their own cultural uh, mannerisms as well. Um, but there's, <clears throat> who is it? It's uh, Valius Pericolis. Um, he has the, uh, the, the Roman general, um, Scipio Emilianus. Uh, when he returns from uh, the wars in Spain, he's uh, sort of berated by uh, a mob of um, citizens in um, Rome, and, and he says to them that uh, you are you are the stepchildren of Italy. So there is a the sources are hinting that uh, there is a there is a new population uh, within Rome itself, and then you have you have people like. Cicero, when, when, when Cicero is in exile, uh, so this is about the, the mid first century BC, uh, you have him write to his mother and he, he talks about Rome and how he's, he's consoling himself about being displaced from his home city. And he says, look at the multitude of uh, rooftops and houses and people, um, but how many of them are, are actually Roman or, or, or Italian? And he also talks about exile is, is sort of everywhere, that how many cities and places in the Mediterranean are there that, um, that people have just sort of relocated to? They, they just, they move around, they, they dispossess themselves from their, their, their homeland. Um, but you, you have, a transformation of Roman culture in that period. And it, it may be um, also a, a transformation of its people as the Romans become uh, something else from what their, their, their ancestors necessarily were. I mean, the famous one is uh, Juvenal and, and Juvenal, uh, he is, uh, well, he says a lot of outlandish things in his satires, but he says, you, you never, you never sure how serious to take his work, um, but he says that the way he's complaining about foreigners and and people who are not Italian, uh, and he he says that uh, he's exhausted by living in a a Greek city as he calls Rome, and he, he makes that complaint that there are um, uh, he says that the Orantes the 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 city. The, sorry, the river that, that flows into uh, Antioch, uh, past Antioch and, and uh, through sort of northern Syria. He says that that has become a tributary of the, the Tiber. So from that, you can sort of imagine uh, a flowing of uh, Greek and Greek Asiatic people um, from Syria into Rome. And it's been known for a long time from inscriptions and we're never sure how accurate inscriptions might be, because there might be a bias that, that wealthy people um, will tend to produce these, these inscriptions or that freedmen would have more to celebrate um, if they made it, if they became wealthy and, and were enfranchised. And um, it's also a reference, who is it? Um, Lucan, the Fasalia, um, he, he talks about the one of the very brutal civil wars um, that, that ended the Republic. And he says that if the, it's Pompey and it's Caesar and they're fighting and the, the legions are going to fight each other. And he says, if the, the ground demands an outpouring of uh, Roman blood, at least 
the people would be spared, these people being um, Cappadocians and, and Galatians and Syrians and uh, other people from Asia Minor, and they would form the the later Roman citizenry. Um, but I mean, it's 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 there's probably a, a mixing of uh, Mediterranean people. Uh, um, what did Hopkins call it? Uh, Rome is this sort of blender or an, uh, a motor of the Roman economy. Um, that once the, this cordon of empire is established around the Mediterranean, and there's a free movement of peoples, then uh, there's a, a sort of uh, blending of identity. So what the genetic information may be finding is that, um, along with this cultural transference, there was a, an, an, a great intermixing of peoples with Rome at the very center. Um, I, I mean, the I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about, um, especially uh, Virgil in the Aeneid, and this great propaganda piece. Well, it's it's might be critical of the Emperor Augustus, but Virgil writes this sort of a, a new myth for the empire. Um, so perhaps he's taking this ancestral hero, uh, Aeneas, on a tour and maybe if you were from uh, Anatolia and if you're a Greek from Syria or Antioch and you moved to Rome, you would find some reassurance or if you were from uh, one of the North African colonies or, or cities, you would find a reassurance in thinking that there was some ancestral hero that you could adopt that had been on this great tour of the Mediterranean and then defeated the 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 Italians or the people of Latium and um, being submerged by them and now you were re-emerging um, mm. but it, it may be commercial it may be a sort of irresistible process I mean if you read Acts and, and St. Paul and the um, there's, there might be 270 people on the, the boat that he takes to the ship that he takes to Rome and, and Josephus um, the historian he, he describes maybe um, he says there's about 600 people on the ship that he took to Rome so if you think that the grain door is uh, the grain door from Egypt is is 30,000 tons and maybe several hundred ships and um, you might have a constant flow of people um, towards Rome itself and sorry that's a very long a long no, it's fascinating yeah I think that a great point about uh, the Aeneid and how that might actually be quite flattering for the new new population of uh people of Anatolian descent to, to be connected to Rome's origins as well as as our Anatolian origins of Tro the Trojans and whatever but uh, did, uh, did you I also wanted to see here your, your uh, idea on the on the Indian DNA in Lebanon because that's a yes. I mean, I mean, it's possible that uh, well, there could have been movement in the during the time of the Persian Empire, uh, but I, I'd imagine that that was limited. Um, I mean, there are clay tablets from Persepolis that, that mention uh, Iranian named people moving from India, whether to begin. The, the Persian Royal Road. So there was a movement of people, uh, maybe administrators, support staff um, from the, the Indus territories to Persepolis um, during the time of the, the Hellenic successors. Uh, there would have been um, the, the Mahouts, the, uh, the people who could control and, and drive the elephants. I mean, one of Alexander's schemes was to have part of the, the Macedonian military established with uh, uh, elephants, Indian elephants that could sort of rampage across the battlefield and, and crash into these uh, phalanx battle lines. Um, and it's only his, presumably his funeral carriage as it's described as uh, these, these elephants. So it would have been a transfer of um, Indian peoples perhaps into the Seleucid kingdom through that. Um, some of the figures in the sources suggest 500 elephants, uh, Chandragupta, uh, uh, the Mauryan Empire was supposedly giving 
uh, the Seleucid king's elephants. Um, so perhaps Indian personnel were transferred along with the, the animals to control them. Um, the, the Ptolemies, one of the reasons that they established base stations in the, the Red Sea and ports was to try to get elephants from East Africa. And there's inscriptions in the Eastern desert uh, where they would have taken these animals off the transport ships. And uh, there's Indians, they might be Indian people, they might be Indos, uh, they might be the, these Mahouts as the, uh, the Greeks called all the sort of elephant drivers uh, Indians, obviously because that was where the skill originally came from. Um, in the Roman period, um, I think the study was centered around Beirut, um, Lebanon and uh, Tyre. And of course, that's one of the terminals for the, the overland uh, Silk Route. So what you find is that um, it's actually Procopius, the, uh, the historian from sort of the sixth century, so the Justinianic period, uh, but he talks about that region being um, from ancestral times, so from very early times, that was a, a great area for um, industry and, and textile work and, and dyeing. And we find in the Chinese and the Roman sources that uh, because that was the part of the coast where they could extract, you know, the glands of the maritime, the these maritime snails, these. Um, oh, the, that's where you get the purple dye, yes. Yeah, the, the purple dye and the uh, there's a blue dye that can be extracted. So these become great centers for the reweaving of uh, silk and the production of textiles and the Huhan Shu and other Chinese works mention that the Romans are exporting reworked Chinese silks back across the Silk Road um, through Iran. And um, there's also numerous references to uh, silk industries in um, the, the Jewish texts, the, the Talmud. And um, so fabrics are moving, they're being reworked. And of course, Tyre and, and Sidon are also great maritime centers uh, because of the prevailing wind patterns in the Mediterranean, uh, the, the grain ships coming from Alexandria that, that feed Rome, that provide the dole for the, the citizens, uh, they tend to go up the, the Lebanon coast. So you imagine that they would be receiving uh, fabrics there. And, and, and uh, Galen also mentions uh, seeing a caravan of Indian merchandise coming in. Uh, Galen sort of visited the, the Phoenician area just to look for drug remedies and um, he was buying a substance called lichium and he said that he was convinced it was genuinely Indian because it arrived at a, as a sort of from camels and of course you have Palmyra there and um, we find that when Aurelian leads his triumph of uh, Zenobia through Rome that there are Indian people in attendance. So maybe these were associated with, maybe they were in the Palma, Palmarine community or um, they were ambassadors or, but I'd imagine there'd be a, a constant trickle of people through the, the, the sort of Persian Gulf. Uh, I mean, Procopius also mentions uh, Christian churches in, um, Sri Lanka, and he, they wow, were, that, that, that. Uh, they were obviously through um, Persian connections, um, voyages through the Persian Gulf, and then down the west coast of India, um, and also the uh, the Apostle Thomas is supposed to have um, the Acts of Thomas. Uh, he departs for in India as a carpenter and finds employment in India. So there's probably. Uh, movement the other way as well that, that Indian people are coming into uh, Persian territories and even moving into the empire through the overland routes there sorry that was a that's, quite a that's, extensive yeah it was extensive comprehensive thank you very much Farl. I, I think we have to I've got a couple of um, questions from the audience uh, that I have to read out uh, super chats one says um, Pliny 
Pliny says the Romans received Indian prisoners from the Suebi in 63 BC. Is this likely to be true? And if so, how did they end up in Germany? Oh, this is very interesting. I, I thought this might appear. Um, well, the Indians, um, we have uh, um, a coins from Arian about how um, there were routes of passage through Bactria and Afghanistan. And it's possible, it's possible that Indians, well, when I start this, uh, in, Indian merchants are everywhere. They, they appear in China in the first century AD um, with, with Buddhist, uh, Buddhist, Buddhist missionaries and they're present, um, they're noted at the, the, the funeral arrangements of um, one of the, the, the early Chinese emperors. Uh, the, the White Horse Monastery is what it's called. So they're moving through the Tarim territories and there's a lot of cultural influence from India in those areas. So it's possible they were also moving towards the West that um, from Bactria, those Indians that were moving into uh, the Tarim territories and the Oasis kingdoms, they would also have been moving into Sogdia and, and from Sogdia, uh, you can follow the, the Duraxes or the even the Oxus. Yeah, the step routes is, is one possibility. Um uh but they can sort of they can head for the RL Sea and from the RL Sea um you can head across to the sort of Caspian area. Mm. And from the Caspian you can sort of head across into the Caucasus region and um Maybe get picked up and enslaved by some some yes. Scythian, some, some, some tribe in that region, and then there's passed a, on to the. There's a, when uh, Pompey is exploring the sort of east coast of the Black Sea, he talks about Phasis. Um, it's a, a port um, in in Colchis, which is the uh, the uh, Caucasus Mountains, and he finds uh, he finds Indian merchandise. And he thinks, well, why does Indian merchandise end up on the east coast of the Black, the Black Sea? And he, he leads a sort of investigation, and then he finds out that it's being imported um, across the Caucasus region. It's coming from the Caspian area. And he suggests a route from the Caspian um, through to Sogdia and somehow through to Bactria. Um, I mean, it is also, it's possible that some Indian peoples might have followed that route, ended up in Phasis along with their trade goods, and then headed across to the Danube. I mean, uh, once you're at Phasis, you're, you're on a trade loop, and the trade loop will take you around to um, the Crimea, and from the Crimea, you will get to the, the Danube. And uh, mm. it, well. Uh, some, so I guess there weren't any, um, but, there weren't any square be there, but I guess some other people could have enslaved them first and sold them to the Swaby, and then they... I was going to mention the uh, Usapai who, who sailed around, um, sailed around Scotland. Uh, they were recruited into the Roman army. They, they ended up uh, part of uh, Agrippa's, uh, sorry, Agricola's in, invasion of Scotland, and they ended up sailing around Britain, and they ended up... Uh, somehow back in their homeland and a few of them were bought and then sold on to other tribes and then sold on to other tribes. Uh, but there certainly is uh, very complicated step routes uh, that it seems a really unlikely story and I can't find an easy explanation. Like, but yeah, I can know that that Yeah. If it you know made a good in the process, then you're uh, part of the way there. Yeah, I, I, I guess it can't. It's incredible if, that, that, that the slaves ended up in Swabia, uh, among the in Swabia, but uh, I think it would make a great film or something. Um, I've got another question here. Um, uh, this one's for me. Uh, I was from Taekwondo Chest. Hey, Jive, I was hiking in Switzerland to, to some stone carvings from the Bronze Age. Should I send you some pictures of the carvings? Yes, please do. That sounds very interesting. Well, um, 
we're, I guess we've we've passed an hour now, and it's been a really fascinating talk. Uh, thank you again, Ralph, for joining me. Before we d end the discussion, I just wanted you to, to, if you want to tell us a little bit more about your forthcoming book uh, about the Oasis Kingdoms and um, if, and when it will be available, and also where your existing books are available to buy. Right. Um, actually, my next book is going to be a uh, collaboration I've co-authored with um, two uh, Australian professors. Um, you, you might know the work of uh, Professor Kim, um, who wrote about the the, the Huns, and um, uh, but that book will be called um, Roman China: Points of Contact, and it will be quite a, a heavy academic work. Uh, I, I was working on it earlier this year. So we'll look at um, contact between Rome and the Chinese Empire. And also uh, part of my contribution was the Justinianic period. So uh, the Justinianic economy, the sixth century, um, the period beyond that, um, the Gotha Turks, the the first sort of engagement between the Byzantines and the, the sort of steppe peoples of uh, Central Asia. Um, but my, my my own book, my my third installment after the Indian Ocean and the Silk Roots is the Oasis Kingdoms, and it should be um, it's, everything's ready except footnoting. So uh, that's still to be done, um, and then I'll have it. Uh, I will publish it with. Uh, pen and sword, so it will be uh, affordable. Um, it will be uh, an accessible work. Great. Uh, is, it, is, is it possible to buy it through uh, your personal website? I've linked to that in the description, aralmacoughlin.com, I think. Is, is that right? Yes, uh, I'll put a link, um, but also pen and sword's uh, mm -hmm. website. Um, they have my two books there. Um, my other book is Bloomsbury, but it's an academic monograph, and it, it kind of it, it's very expensive, and it's usually um, inaccessible, uh, too much demand. Yeah. I think. yeah, academic texts often become uh, unreasonable, unreasonably priced. But uh, yeah, I'm glad that uh, those other books are available by Pen and Sword. So uh, I recommend everyone to check those out and to subscribe to Raoul's channel, which is very interesting indeed. Um, thank you all again. I'll be back on Tuesday for another Jive Talk. we will be joined again by Stirler Ellen Vorg to discuss his recent problems with the University of Copenhagen. Thank you once again, Raoul, for joining me. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.